Some years ago, there was a magazine article that detailed the story of a man who, in his infancy, had become blind, but now, as an adult, had received his sight through the wonders of modern medicine. And in the article, the interviewer asked the man, uh, what is life like now? Tell us, what does it mean after all these years to suddenly be able to see? And the man initially said what you would expect, things like, you know, the colors are amazing and it's wonderful to be able to see the faces of, of loved ones and so forth. But the interviewer expected him to say these kind of things and he wanted him to say something extraordinary, something totally unexpected about how his life had changed since getting his sight back. And so he, he asked him, what is the most unexpectedly beautiful thing you've seen? Now, if you were asked that question, how do you think you would respond? Perhaps you might talk about the hues of a particular sunset or perhaps the, the smile of a, of a loved one or something. Well, the formerly blind man didn't mention anything like that. Instead, he said that the most beautiful thing he had seen was the leaves falling in autumn. And he said, I knew that leaves fall. I knew that people rake them and put them in piles and throw them away or burn them. But I always imagined that the leaves came down just like a blanket. I didn't know that when leaves fall that they actually each pitch and glide and turn in the wind as they come down to the ground. It's like a dance, and it's beautiful. Like a dance. Most interesting observation, most especially because of its irony. I mean, think about it. The most beautiful thing this man saw was a dying thing. That's what falling leaves are. They're they're dying. Yet in this ending, this death, this seemingly worst moment, he saw beauty, a gift, a dance. And this is something of what I'd like to talk about this morning. Learning this very dance. That is, discovering the beauty and gift of even the very worst times. Today we begin a new series which will take us through the next handful of weeks in which we're going to be, we're going to be looking at the subject of of joy, the, the perfect joy that is supposed to be ours always as followers of the risen Christ. You know, the season immediately following Easter is sometimes referred to as the season of joy, as we celebrate God's victory over the greatest obstacles to life, namely sin and death. The great preacher Billy Sunday used to say, if you're a Christian and you're not happy, then there must be a leak in your Christianity somewhere. This is what often happens. We've got a lot of, a lot of leaky Christians walking around out there. Joyfulness is the hallmark of the Christian faith, yet let's face it, such joy often eludes us in the ups and downs of life, and so this is what we're going to be exploring, particularly considering some of the obstacles to joy, the, uh, the things that block us from it, and what to do about them. The first obstacle we are considering today being hard times, those, those times when life just goes wrong, just does not go right. Uh, to guide us in this study, we're going to be using uh, the book of Philippians. That's the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Uh, Philippi being a, a city in eastern Macedonia, now part of Thrace in Greece. Uh, this letter is commonly referred to as the letter of joy. It just abounds with rejoicing, and this is understandable, as the Philippian church was the congregation Paul was closest to. Uh, there was a deep mutual affection between them. Uh, what is not quite so understandable, though, is that, as Paul makes clear, he is writing this letter from prison. This is the subtext to our reading today, and indeed to the whole letter. Paul is in Rome awaiting trial and possible execution for his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, how can a person be in jail on death row itself and be this joyful? Well, that's exactly what Paul is going to let us in on. We're going to look at a couple of snapshots from this letter as we explore the nature of true Christian joy. And today we begin where Paul begins. He begins with gratitude. After the salutation, his opening line is, I thank my God every time I remember you. It has been said that if the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it would be sufficient. It's the most perfect of prayers, and as we've known so many times in the past, is the foundation of all happiness, it's a grateful heart, it's aware of its blessings. This is where Paul begins, and what is he most thankful for? It's the people God has brought into his life. And again, I would suggest that he is saying that to each and every one of us that this is the same. That joy begins in recognizing the gift of the people God has brought into our lives. From this then, though, we move on to the real focal point of his opening discussion, namely, finding joy in the tough times. This is what Paul discusses in our text today. And his basic, the basic outline of his thought here is this. As mentioned, Paul is under arrest, potentially facing execution. We don't know exactly when, during his Roman imprisonment, this letter was written, but we do know that Paul spent uh, two years there. 
And he begins by noting that this bad situation for him has actually resulted in some very good things happening. This being the driving theme of the whole section, God bringing great good out of bad, specifically the greatest possible good, namely, people coming to know the love of Jesus Christ. As Paul observes, many of the Roman soldiers, the guards who watch over him, have come to faith in Christ through his witness. And outside of the prison, many of his fellow Christians have become strengthened in their own faith, witnessing to Christ even more after seeing his example of love and, and trust in the Lord. This idea of trust in the, in the Lord being the idea that Paul that picks up on in the next paragraph, in which he addresses the very real issue that he may die here in prison. And on this issue, he makes a rather unusual observation, basically, that he is unsure what he most wants, to live or to die, to be set free or to be executed. Now understand, he doesn't make this statement in a morbid sense, like, like he wants to die, like he's suicidal or something, no. The reason for his internal struggle is this, and it's, it's one of the greatest lines in the letter, if not in the whole Bible. He says, For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. His point? That, that this life, this life here is great. You know, he's saying, I get to know and serve Jesus and his people in the world. It's an incredible blessing. But the life beyond is even better. I get to be with Jesus. Essentially, what he's saying is, I'm in a win-win situation. No matter what happens, I cannot lose with Jesus Christ. This being another undergirding point, he's trying to get across to the reader that this is where you stand at all times if you believe in Jesus. You are in a permanent win-win scenario. You cannot lose as long as you just hold on to Jesus. Relax. And that's exactly what Paul does, what he models for us here. This essential confidence in Christ, as we see enabling Paul to be relaxed and open to events happening in all sorts of different ways. He's not hung up on one specific course of events being the only way that life can be good. He knows that with Jesus, he wins no matter what. So Paul's unsure what outcome would be best. However, getting back to the theme he has begun, that, that God is working great good here, that people are coming to know Christ. As Paul notes, he believes that he will probably live a little while longer, since God still has work for him to do it. It is generally understood that this is what comes to pass. Uh, he is released and he goes on to do more ministry. Now in the middle of all this, in the middle of these paragraphs, we get a kind of a strange passage that at first glance seems almost like an aside, something off topic, but which is actually perhaps the pivotal paragraph of the section. Paul discusses other Christians who are proclaiming the gospel for selfish reasons. Basically, they are church leaders who in the name of the Lord are really seeking more their own prestige and their own following. In this, Paul is addressing a problem within the church at all times, arguably one of the most destructive forces within the church. It's the pursuit of personal power. It destroys a lot of congregations, a lot of individual discipleship, and a lot of witness and mission of the church. As it has been said, the world is run by the desire for money, but the church is run by the desire for power. It's a universal problem. Of course, we don't suffer from it here. <laughs> We're all good. I'm talking about other folks. Right. Remember, here Paul's he's having a very specific impact in regards to his situation, you see. As he is in trouble, some of his fellow church leaders are, are selflessly trying to help him for the sake of the gospel, but others are using his troubles to their own advantage, taking him down so that they might be lifted up. Now, you'd think that Paul would be really angry about this. But once again, he goes in a completely unexpected direction. It's the pivotal line of the whole passage, as he says, regarding those who are proclaiming the gospel, even out of impure motives. He says, what does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. You see, it's always back to his fundamental point, that even in bad times, even when proclaimed out of wrong motives, people are finding Jesus. Jesus is happening, and in this is the very heart of Paul's joy. As he says, and in that I rejoice. The word rejoice here literally meaning to have your innards sweet, or to feel great inside. Some translate it as, I dance within. And thus our sermon title for today. Basically, in the midst of overwhelming hardship, everything going about as wrong as it possibly can, he's in prison, held captive, death, a very real daily possibility. Some of the very people who should be helping him have turned against him. In the midst of all this, Paul's first point is that he dances within. He has joy because he sees Jesus happening all around. People are coming to know Christ. He realizes that God can use anything, even the worst things, even the wrong things, to make the ultimate good of Christ's love take hold. And that's what he looks for in life. His first crucial lesson on joy for us. In hard times, 
Look to make Christ happen in the lives of others, and joy will overtake you. The question being, how do we learn to do this? How, how do we learn to do the same dance of joy in our own hard times? Well, I'd like to offer three suggestions, three steps. Step one, have this purpose. One author writes, there is a story that's told involving Yogi Berra, the well-known catcher for the New York Yankees, and Hank Aaron, who at the time was the chief power hitter for the Milwaukee Braves. The teams were playing in the World Series, and as usual, Yogi was keeping up his ceaseless chatter, intending to pep up his teammates on the one hand and distract the Milwaukee batters on the other. As Aaron came to the plate, Yogi, Yogi tried to distract him by saying, Henry, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. You're supposed to hold it so that you can read the trademark. Aaron didn't say anything, but when the next pitch came in, he hit it into the left field bleachers. After rounding the plates and tagging up at home plate, Aaron stopped, looked at Yogi straight in the eye, and said, I didn't come up here to read. <laughs> See, Aaron knew what he was there for, and that's why he succeeded. Something of our first point here. Paul was a winner. He was particularly able to conquer adversity and be joyful even in the toughest of times because he knew what he was here for. He had a strong sense of purpose. He didn't let himself get distracted. It's a well-proven fact that people who have a strong sense of purpose for their lives, a mission and a task, do far better. Most especially are much better equipped to handle bad times than those who have no real sense of purpose for their lives. They have a drive, see, that keeps them going instead of stalling out. You know, what's the old saying? You know, it is better to wear out than to rust out. A lot of folks, even a lot of Christian folks, unfortunately, choose to rust out. All they're ever talking about is their retirement, when they can be done, right? Of course, within this, it's vitally important to have a purpose that's actually big enough to live on. Many people have a sense of purpose, but it's too small to really sustain a life. Their goal is to make money, or to be comfortable, or to have things, you know, whatever. It's a purpose, but it's too small. You, you can't really live off it. It collapses when things get tough. Well, as Paul noted, as, as, as noted, Paul's purpose is clear, and it is a grand purpose. It is getting people to know the love of Jesus Christ. It is, in fact, the purpose of every single Christian of all time. Do you ever wonder what your purpose in life is? Well, if you're a Christian, this is what it is. You know? As the great C.S. Lewis once said, the glory of God and as our only means of, to glorifying Him, the salvation of human souls, is the real business of life. The real business of life is the salvation of souls. As a Christian, it is job one. Now you may say, you know, no, I, I feel my purpose is to be a good parent, or to be a good spouse, or to be a good citizen, whatever. And all these things are great, but really as a Christian, all these things are actually just subheadings of, a living, of living the love of Jesus Christ, of getting that out to the world. What unfortunately happens to a lot of Christians is that they lose this, or maybe they never even had to begin with. They lose any sense of purpose, especially their specific purpose in, in Christ. And thus, when hardships show up, they get distracted, and they fall apart. They step up to bat, and the catcher whispers something to them, and they forget how to swing. You know? Their whole life collapses since they're trying to build upon nothing. It happens all the time. It's like, I'm reminding you of the true story preacher Chuck Swindle tells about a man living in Atlanta who one day was flipping, you know, flipping through the yellow pages in search of a restaurant. He noticed an entry for a place called the Church of God Grill, and his curiosity got the best of him, and so he dialed the number, and he, the man answered with a very cheery, hello, Church of God Grill, and the caller asked how the restaurant had gotten such an unusual name. Well, the man answered, we started selling uh, chicken dinners at our church, every church on Sunday, to help pay the bills. And people love the chicken, and we did such a good business, we found ourselves needing to shorten up our church services in order to get enough dinners ready on time. After a while, we just closed down the church altogether and just served chicken dinners. Right. And we kept the name we started with, and that's the Church of God Grill. Think about that. After a while, we closed down the church altogether and just served chicken dinners. Now, the next fish bake is coming up, so I don't want to be getting any ideas. <laughs> but you see, this is what happens all the time. We Christians, we forget what we're really about. When that gets put further and further away, we get more and more about other things, and the whole thing just becomes ridiculous. And unable to support us because it's no better, no different than anything else. We become just a restaurant or something. 
Strong people, joyful Christians, even in tough times, have a clear sense of their purpose in Jesus Christ. As a great preacher once said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then rest assured, you are not saved yourself. For if you have discovered the saving love of Jesus Christ, then by definition, you must long for others to share in it. True Christians are more concerned with reaching the lost than pampering the saved. Step one in learning to dance within, to find joy even the hardest of times, have this purpose. Step two then, celebrate the victories. Have you ever heard the fable of the pedigreed cat? There once was a beautiful pedigreed cat that lived in a huge mansion on a hill, and the cat had everything. The cat was warm in the cold winter and cool in the hot summer. The cat had a choice of food every day, fresh tuna, beef, or pork. The cat ate out of silver dishes and drank bottled water out of crystal glassware. One of the master's servants was assigned to give any attention that the pedigreed cat wanted. Each night, the owner would sit in front of the fireplace and read and gently pet the cat. The owner loved petting the cat, but the cat would get so angry because the owner would always rub him the wrong way. One day, in great anger, the pedigreed cat ran away from home. The pedigree cat was in the alley looking for food out of a garbage can when an alley cat came up and asked the pedigree cat, what are you doing here in the alley? The beautiful cat explained that it had run away. They couldn't take it anymore. The alley cat said, well, you know, what can you take? The beautiful cat said, my owner always rubs me the wrong way. What else could I do but run away? The old alley cat replied, you foolish feline. You didn't need to run away. All you had to do was turn the other way on the pillow. <laughs> When things rub you the wrong way, you know, often all we need to do is turn and take things from a different perspective, a different direction. Something of our second point here. As mentioned, Paul begins this opening section of the letter by saying, I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. He praises the good things that have occurred because of his hardships. Notice that he does not say, I want you to know, beloved, all the ways that the Lord has helped me and worked out all my problems. No. He rejoices in any good that is going on around him. Any way the love of Christ is happening that he is part of, even if it doesn't help his situation at all. Very simple second lesson here. Don't just look in your life for what God is doing for you, how God is coming through for you, fixing your problems, getting you out of your hardships. Look instead for how God is at work, however God is at work, around you, in, in, in other lives, in, in the midst of your troubles. You know, whatever Jesus is up to, wherever Jesus is happening, change your perspective. Look for that. Christians who dance within, who know joy even in hard times, seek however Jesus is happening in the lives around them. Is this our greatest joy? No. Are we looking for this? In his book, The Year of Jubilee, preacher Tony Campolo, he tells a story about being in a church in Oregon where he was asked to pray for a man who had cancer. And Campolo prayed boldly for the man's healing. And then next week, he got a telephone call from the man's wife. And she said, you prayed for my husband. Uh, he had cancer. And Campolo thought that when he heard her use the past tense of the verb, that the cancer had been eradicated and cured. But before he could think much about it, she said, he died. And Campolo felt terrible, like he, like he was a failure. But she continued, don't feel bad. When he came into church that Sunday, my husband was filled with anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short time, and he, he hated God. He was only 58, and he wanted to see his children and grandchildren grow up. He was angry that this all-powerful God didn't take away his sickness and heal him. He would lie in bed and curse God. The more his anger grew towards God, the more miserable he was to everybody around him. It was an awful thing just to be in his presence. But, the woman told Campolo, after you prayed for him, suddenly a peace came over him and a joy came into him. Tony, the last three days have been the best days of our lives. We've sung, we've laughed, we've read scripture, we prayed, we hugged. Oh, it's been fantastic days. And I called to thank you for laying your hands on him and praying for healing. And then she said something incredibly profound. She said simply, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. Mm -hmm. Step number two in learning to dance within, to find joy, even in the worst times. Celebrate all the victories, even if it's not exactly what you're looking for. And then finally, step number three. Seek the opportunities. In the end, in our reading today, Paul's reflecting upon his imprisonment. And to really grasp the message here, we need to understand a little bit of how things worked back then. Paul was a Roman citizen, 
And as a Roman citizen, while under arrest, uh, you're not held in jail. Paul wasn't held in jail. Rather, he was held under house arrest. And under house arrest, he was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Think about it. Historians tell us that the chain between their handcuffs would be, be just about 18 inches long. And the soldiers would serve six-hour shifts. In other words, Paul would be chained to four different soldiers every day with different soldiers each day. Never a break. Never a moment alone. And this went on for two solid years. Now, why is this important? Well, what is Paul? He's a preacher. And what does a preacher live to do? They live to preach. Or you can say it even more bluntly, they live to talk, right? You know? And most especially, preachers love to talk to unbelievers about Jesus. Well, in effect, this is what the Roman Empire is providing for Paul, a captive audience. Realize it's not just that he's chained to them, they're chained to him. Right? It's almost comical. And Paul, he recognizes this. He's laughing, you know? Paul even specifically mentions, he says, It has become known among the, the, the whole imperial guard that my imprisonment is for Christ. The imperial guard, also known as the Praetorian Guard, were, they, were, they were Rome's elite. They were the creme de la creme, you know? Highly respected, highly honored, specially trained. This is who Paul is having daily conversations with, and these guys have a lot of influence. Under any normal circumstance, the odds of Paul having contact with one of these guys is slim to none. But here they are literally being brought to him and chained up to him. And this, in the end, is what Paul's rejoicing in here. It seems like a horrible situation, and I'm sure it was. But he also realized that this is an incredible opportunity. It would never have happened were it not for his hardship. And Paul is seizing the opportunity, not just seeing a problem, but a possibility. Final lesson for us all here. In our lives, ironically, most especially in the, in the worst moments in our lives, we get brought into situations, have experiences, meet people, where we have tremendous once-in-a-lifetime opportunities to reach them with the gospel. Joyful people see life in this way. Wherever you are, however life seems to have chained you, to pain, to illness, to hardship, to failure, to loss. Don't just see the problem, see the opportunity, and make the most of it. In closing, consider this. Christian author Eric Butterworth, he tells of a young soldier who lost his legs while stepping on a landmine while serving in Bosnia. And when he awoke in the military hospital in Germany, he found that he would never walk again. Uh, and when he found that, something just died within him. He lay in his hospital bed staring you know, blankly at the ceiling, and he refused to talk with anyone. He refused to cooperate with the doctors and the nurses, and all he wanted to do was just die. Well, one day a young man strolled into his room and sat down in the chair next to his bed. Quietly he drew from his pocket a, a harmonica and he began to play softly. The patient looked at him for a moment and then back at the ceiling, and that was all for that day. The next day the harmonica player came again. For several days he continued to come and play quietly as the young soldier uh, lay in bed. And one day he said, you know, uh, does my playing bother you? And the patient in the bed said, no, I guess I like it. And they talked for a while and each day their conversation went a little longer. One day the harmonica player was in a very jovial mood and he played a lively tune and he began to do a little tap dance. However, the other soldier in the bed looked on unimpressed. Hey, why don't you smile once and let the world know you're alive, the dancer said. The legless soldier just replied, I might as well be dead as the, as the fix that I'm in. Okay, answered his happy friend, so you're dead. But you're not as dead as that guy who was crucified 2,000 years ago and he came out of it okay. Mm. Oh, that's easy for you to say, the patient replied, but if you were in my fix, you'd sing a different tune. And with that, the dancer stood up and said, I, I know a 2,000-year-old resurrection is pretty far in the dim past, so maybe an up-to-date example will help you believe it can be done. And with that, he pulled up the trouser legs of his pants, and the young man in the bed looked and saw two artificial limbs. The tap-dancing fellow with the harmonica was not just some starry-eyed Pollyanna. He, he himself had once played where the other soldier, the young soldier lay. He, too, had faced despair of a loss. He, too, had thought, I can't go on. What's the point? But the resurrection of, of the wounded Jesus had turned his can into a can, and he was there to share it with the young soldier in the bed. And so he did. And the young man in the bed eventually came to know the joy of life again through Jesus Christ our Lord. Despite overwhelming hardship and trouble, Paul danced within. 
might we do the same? First step in living resurrection joy, the, the joy that we as disciples of the risen Lord are supposed to be living all the time. Find God's perfect joy in the worst of times. Have this purpose, celebrate all victories, and seek the opportunities. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 261, Lord of the Dance. Would you please stand? Thank you.